The Andy Poland Show. we got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. All right, a little more sunshine to start the day. Well, I say start the day. You know, depends when you start your day. Some people start their day like I do very, very early. And some people have jobs that allow them to get out of bed like now. I haven't had one of those jobs in a long time, but I did it one time. So when I'd wake up and see sunshine, it would be actual sunshine. I wake up in the dark pretty much 365 days a year. But eh, is what it is. Uh, we're getting some cold weather, but uh, no white Christmas. And from what they're saying, no precipitation until next week, and that's going to be rain. So Doug Cameron and your troops... I know you're at the ready. You're ready to go round the clock with snow coverage, but not yet. Not yet. All right. Uh, coming up today, um, we've got more from YouTube treasures as as things float to the surface. Uh, as I said um, earlier this week, there have been some things that Joe Buck did uh, some years ago. It's got to be at least four or five years ago. Uh, where he did a series of interviews, and we played some of what he did uh, with Jerry Jones the other day, and uh, and then we also play. We're going to play from what he said with uh, Troy Aikman in kind of response to the whole Jimmy Johnson Michigas, which is going to uh, finally come to some kind of a con- conclusion uh, when Jer- Jimmy goes into the Ring of Honor on the uh, on the thirtieth on the last uh, last home game of the season. For them, um, and we'll also get uh, we'll get to some comments from uh, Jeff Saturday about uh, he was on yesterday on on our morning show about uh, the race in the NFC East between the Cowboys and the Eagles, who he likes on that, and all kinds of different things. As uh, we're in kind of this weird period where there's going to be no playoffs for the Commanders, but there's a dead season that's being dragged along for another three weeks, and I want to parse some of the comments that Ron Rivera made to Chick Hernandez on Channel 9 about the quarterback situation, which at one time, at least in Rivera's mind, was rock solid. We're going with Sam the whole way, come hell or high water, and we're going to let him take his lumps. We're going to leave him in in blowouts because he's got to learn and he's our guy. And we saw some wavering last week in Los Angeles, last Sunday, when he benched Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett came into a game that was winnable. I mean, this was 28-7, to It was unlikely that they were going to win the game, but not impossible. And great quarterbacks have pulled off comebacks like that. Uh, Jacoby Brissett almost did. He put up two touchdowns quickly, suddenly found the disappearing man, Terry McLaurin, who the week before, uh, no, game before, I should say, they had a buy in between. And the game before had been targeted three times against Miami, didn't have a catch. And he had one of his great games in this one, thanks to Jacoby Brissett getting him the ball. Now, I want to go through what Ron Rivera said about the benching and, uh, and what it means the rest of the way, but let's, uh, let's get started with this. And uh, I did watch at least the first half. I was kind of dozing in the second half, and I thought, you know, oh, God, here, here goes another ugly Maryland loss. And I, once again, against Nichols, I guess it used to be Nichols State. Now it's just Nichols. Against Nichols, they missed 40 shots. Uh, they're a terrible shooting team. They were 22 of 62 from the field. And from the free throw line, uh, they also missed 10 free throws, 19 of 29. Now, part of it is Julian Reese gets fouled a lot, and he's not a very good foul shooter. But uh, they just do do not shoot the ball well. Uh, From three, uh, they were okay, uh, 10 of 27. Um, But, you know, they're not a good three-point shooting team either. And this is a team that they probably should have beaten by 20, but uh, you have a number of things working against you, including the uh, post-exam break hangover that they have, and also maybe looking a little bit ahead to playing UCLA on the road on Friday. Now, remember when Kevin Willard came in, he worked out a deal because he knew Mick Cronin well from their days, I guess, in the Big East with, uh, with when Mick Cronin was at Cincinnati. And uh, so he worked it out that they would have a home and home. And UCLA came to Maryland last year and there was great hype for that game. They sold out the arena and Maryland was never in it. They, They lost the game 87 to 60 and it probably wasn't that close. 
But uh, this will be their first time going to Pauley Pavilion since 1981. Uh, I, I didn't realize it had been that long. But if you are of a certain age and if you grew up here and you think Maryland UCLA, um, there is a much bigger connection than you might imagine. Now, it's been said over the years that Lefty Drizel arrived at Maryland and said, we're going to make Maryland the UCLA of the East. That's not exactly what happened there. Uh, when he came to Maryland, he got together with Jay McMillan, who was Tom McMillan's older brother, who had already finished his career at Maryland. I believe he played with Gary Williams in the mid-60s there. And Lefty and Jay Williams were, I guess, having lunch, and Jay said, hey, you know, this is a sleeping giant here. You've got the opportunity to turn Maryland into the UCLA of the East. And so Lefty repeated that story, and somewhere along the line it got translated to Lefty proclaiming that he was going to make Maryland the UCLA of the East. You know, at that time, when, when Lefty got here in 1969, uh, UCLA was, was a powerhouse. They had just finished up the, uh, the Lou Alcindor era. The Bill Walton era was going to start. They even won championships in between. They were in the midst of a seven-year seven championship streak. Every year they won the championship at UCLA. And Lefty did what he could. He recruited Jay's brother, Tom, who was the number one recruit in the country. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. He got Len Elmore here. Eventually, along the way, he got uh, John Lucas, who became the number one pick of the draft. He had he had pro players on his team uh, on a yearly basis, and they were good. And they were competitive with the best teams in the ACC when the ACC was the number one league. So in 1973, uh, 73-74, Lefty had his best team, and I think it's the best team in the history of Maryland. Uh, and it's a team that's remembered for the fact that they got screwed not getting to go to the NCAA tournament because in those days they had only 25 teams, and you had to win the ACC tournament to get in, and Maryland lost that classic game to NC State in overtime. They stayed home. NC State went on to win the championship. Maryland should have been in the tournament that year, but they didn't get in, and uh, they changed the rules because of that. That's when they started the at-large teams. But anyway, uh, to start the 73-74 season, and, and nowadays – you got games played like in early November. But in those days, the season would generally start around Thanksgiving weekend. And Maryland played its first game of the year, December 1st, 1973, at Pauley Pavilion with with Bill Walton going into his senior year, starting his senior year. They were the two-time, no, more than that. They were like the the four-time, five-time, whatever, six-time, seven-time defending champs. They, they, they were a dynasty. And they were the best team in college basketball. And Maryland went out there and battled with them. And it came down to the end, and they were down by one, and UCLA hit a bucket, but it came after the buzzer. And Lefty went over to the scorer's table to make sure that that basket didn't count so they would only lose by one, and they did, 65-64. But in his mind, he had to think, you know what? We're right there with them. And if we can get to the end of the season and we can get in the NCAA tournament and we play UCLA on a neutral floor, we might beat them. They never got that opportunity. Uh, so the last time they were there, and this, again, surprises me, it was that long ago. The last time that Maryland went to UCLA was 1981. And that was not not a pretty pretty sight. Maryland lost the game 90-57. to And those who saw it said it wasn't that close. Uh, UCLA went up 11 to nothing. They were uh, cruising in the first quarter, or first half, I should say, 37 to 10. They were up by 19 at the half and uh, and just, you know, cruised to victory. Maryland, their shooting was terrible. They shot 26% from the field. And this was, this was the 81-82 team. So this is after Buck Williams and Albert King are top 10 picks in the NBA by the New Jersey Nets. So they've lost their two best players. It's a rebuilding year. Um, they had, you know, they had a, a, a freshman who was their leading scorer, um, and they had uh, Reggie Jackson, who turned out to be a big disappointment uh, coming to Maryland after being Philadelphia Player of the Year. Adrian Branch was the freshman who led them in scoring. Jeff Atkins, also a freshman. Herman Veal was a sophomore. It was a young team, and they got their doors blown off by UCLA. And Lefty said after the game, this is not a classic Lefty quote, he said, if we played UCLA a thousand times, they would win every time. They are out of our class, and that's all there is to it. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so we'll see if Maryland can give UCLA a game. UCLA is not as good 
certainly as as they were when Maryland played them in 73 and and not as good when Maryland played them in 1981 when they were then on probation. Uh, Larry Brown had left and left behind some uh, some scandals, so they were ineligible to play in the NCAA tournament that year, 81-82, uh, and Maryland was uh, was not a very good team that year. They're about a 500 team and uh, and just not really really up to the level of uh, UCLA. We'll see what happens on Friday night. All right, the uh, the news, and I guess it's not not a surprise, but this has kind of held the league hostage <laughs> all year. Aaron Rodgers going out after four plays with a torn Achilles, and it wasn't long before he started to talk about coming back before the end of the season. Now. An Achilles tendon injury, especially at his age, is sometimes career-threatening. It's certainly season-ending. But modern surgical techniques, you see him walking without crutches like two weeks after the surgery. He's throwing footballs on the sidelines, and the, the conversation goes on all year. Well, you know, if the Jets are in it, he may make a comeback by Christmas Eve. Well, Christmas Eve is the game against the Commanders this week. And it's been walked all the way up until really today, because today is the deadline for the Jets to activate him if he's going to play. If they don't activate him today, he's shut down for the rest of the season. And it sounds like that's what's going to happen. Uh, Rogers only speaks to his guru, Pat McAfee. He goes on the McAfee show every Tuesday, reportedly paid a million dollars a year or more to do this. And uh, and yesterday told people, you know, pretty much what we've known all season. If I was 100% uh, today, um, I'd be definitely pushing to play. Um, but the fact is, I'm not. I've been working hard to uh, to get closer to that. But I'm still, you know, 14 weeks uh, tomorrow from my surgery, and uh, you know, being medically cleared uh, as 100% uh, healed is just uh, not realistic. At uh, at 14 weeks. Yeah, no, it was never realistic. You know, it, 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 now he did say that if the Jets were still in it, he would have considered playing if he wasn't 100%. Now, that would involve the doctors clearing him, and it would involve the coach, Robert Sala, who Rodgers has already saved his job for this year because he's now saying he wants to come back to the Jets and play two more years, and he wants the same structure in place. And he calls all the shots. So if he wanted to play, he'd be playing and there really is no reason for him to play because they're out of it. There's they're not they're mathematically out as Washington is. Wow, they got pretty good defense. They've wasted a, a Super Bowl caliber defense because they didn't have a capable backup quarterback for Aaron Rodgers. Um, but you know, Rodgers on the field would create a lot of excitement for what is a dead game. It's it's two teams with nine wins between them going nowhere at the end of the year, but he said, you know, if they were in it, he would have considered playing at not 100%. So that that pretty much, I think, slams the door on the idea of him coming back to play, and I think once we get to this afternoon, we'll find out that the Jets are not going to activate him. Another quarterback who's not going to play, not going to play the rest of the season, is uh, Talia Tungavialoa, the Maryland quarterback, who is their all-time leader in just about every statistical category. Um, I think Boomer Esiason was a better college quarterback and probably will prove to be a better pro. I'm not sure uh, Talia is like his brother Tua. He's not as big, uh, not the same same type of uh, body type as as, uh, as Tua, but he is uh, passing up the bowl game that Maryland's going to play in, the Music City Bowl on the 30th in Nashville against Auburn to get ready for the NFL draft. And, uh, and then, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, Mike Loxley uh, didn't even wait to be asked about it yesterday. He uh, just put this in in his news conference in his opening statements. Address the elephant in the room. Um, Talia Tungavailoa has opted out of the game. Um, you know, he won't be playing. We certainly thank him and his family for all he's given this program over the last four years. But like all position, it's next man up. And uh, and this provides Billy Edwards, uh, Cam Edge, Champ Long, Jaden Saray, some of the quarterbacks in our program, an opportunity here. Uh, as we head into the bowl game, and I'm excited for to see what Billy's able to do. Um, you know, you kind of look at this game almost like a uh, preseason game leading into next year. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to evaluate our quarterback situation um, going into the next year. Um, but we got a lot of faith in Billy. We got a lot of faith in Cam that both those guys um, – have the ability, the skill set to operate our system. He's also got a transfer coming in from NC State, so he will have some quarterbacks to choose from 
for next year. Uh, more follow-up on this, though, uh, and, and a couple of, I think, revealing things from uh, Mike Loxley about um, how this all went down. You know, the, they're kind of tied at the hip, uh, Tungabialoa and Loxley. Remember, Loxley was at Alabama, and he recruited Talia there uh, after his brother was there. He may have even recruited Tua to go there. I'm not sure, but um, he brought in his brother, and it was going to look like, you know, maybe an heir apparent situation. But Talia didn't look like he was going to get the Alabama job. So when Loxley came here, he brought him with him, and it's worked out very well. It's a four year starter. He's got all the Maryland passing records, he's got the Big Ten passing yardage record thrown for over 11,000 yards in his career. Uh, And while Loxley would not reveal exactly what the conversation was like when Talia said he wasn't going to play in the bowl game, I think this response tells you a little bit. Listen. He handled it the right way. Uh, You know, for some reason, I think uh, when our fans and sometimes our our supporters have this misconception that we're the only person that has to deal with players not playing, going in the portal, losing top players. I mean, get used to it, people. It's college. It's the landscape of college football. If you have attachment issues, you better get over it quick. And I used to be one of those guys that had attachment issues. I I hate it, like leaving. I hate people leaving me. But this is the world we live in. This generation, she laughed when I call myself a boomer. So this generation is so used to swiping left and starting over and going to the next page that, you know what? Uh, Maybe Coach Locks needs to not be as relationship-based and just become more transactional, which that's the landscape of it. So, uh... He handled it the right way. Great family, great people. Um, He's got some decisions to make, and I'm excited for him. But this is, you look across the country, man, it's happening to everybody. So Maryland fans, understand, this happens to everyone, not just Coach Locks. So we're good. We'll be fine. I I felt like he's a little hurt. That that was my take in listening to that because – they kind of rebuilt the program together. This is three straight bowl games for Maryland. And my feeling about Maryland football is they should be seven, eight, nine wins a year. You're probably not going to get to 10 very often, almost never 11, certainly not 12. They're not, they're not at the level of Michigan or Ohio State, although Loxley came into the season talking about competing for Big Ten titles. I don't know how realistic that is, but – they have made Maryland football respectable together. And I just think that in his heart, Loxley wanted to go out, you know, not go out because he's staying, but but s- send out this team uh, with the quarterback who has started virtually every game for them uh, and not have him opt out over what is a, a pretty decent bowl game. I mean, it's been like the Duke's Mayo Bowl <laughs> and, and some others where, you know, they dump Mayo on the guy's head. Music City... December 30th, Saturday afternoon, pretty good spot. Not a bad spot to be in, and uh, he's going to go on without uh, Talia. Last thing on that from Loxley is the impact that Talia had on the program, uh, being here as long as he was and and starting for him for four years. Well, I think if you look at the quarterbacks that have played in this system, from Tua to Jalen to Mac to to Elia uh, to C.J. Brown and some of these other guys that have had great success in it, that – the system is foolproof and proven that it's a quarterback-driven system, a quarterback-friendly system. And, you know, I think he took – he was perfect, perfectly made for this system for us. Quick release, accuracy, uh, competitive drive. Um, you know, I know for maybe some people around here, I don't think you'll understand the impact of what Leah coming to Maryland uh, will have probably for about 10, 15 years. And then, you know, people will understand that, man, because – I've been around here a long time where we've struggled at quarterback. And, you know, we had a guy that played for four years here and had great success. And, you know, some people still, he leaves here a little bit kind of a Mm -hmm. enigma. People love him or hate him. And I I sure love the kid because of what he's been able to do to elevate Maryland football. Didn't do it by himself. And I know he gets a lot of credit because of the relationship. But kid, pretty special kid. Yeah, it was was fun. I mean, this watching their games – uh, I have not seen quarterback play like that on a consistent basis. Uh, maybe going back 20 years uh, when Ralph Friedgen first took over, he had really good quarterback play his first few years. Uh, so, you know, good for good for Loxley for finding his guy. Now he's got to find a replacement and might not be as easy. You know, when you're picking off the Alabama tree, <laughs> there's often a lot of talent left over. Uh, we'll see what he does moving forward, but he's done a really good job in recruiting and really good job as a head coach. Yeah, they've they've had some questionable decisions during games, but the kind of consistency that he's had in three years hasn't been seen around here 
in a long, long time. Three straight bowl games for uh, Mike Loxley and Maryland, and uh, they move on without Talia. All right, coming up, we will get to uh, what Jeff Saturday said about the NFC East with now the Cowboys and the Eagles tied. He'll give you a front runner there. And Tony and Mike weigh in on a odd recruiting situation where uh, the top quarterback in the country flips from Georgia to Nebraska. We'll stay with that and much more. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We've got a Tony show coming up at 11 o'clock today. You know, the other day, I was uh, maybe it was yesterday, I was, I was lamenting the loss of local coverage. You know, um, John Kelly, who writes... Uh, uh, what used to be called the District Line uh, started in 1947 by Bill Gold. You know, kind of local, little things happening in Washington. Bob Levy wrote that column for a long time, and uh, Kelly is taking the buyout from the Post because the Post is losing a lot of money, and they're they're getting rid of as many salaries as they can before they have to fire people. So uh, good good for John that that he decided to do this, but we'll miss this kind of local thing and I, I i you know kind of lamenting that we just don't have that anymore we used to have local newspapers like the sentinel and the gazette and they're they're all gone and so we're kind of reliant on the post for for local sports coverage local high school my kids long out of high school but when they were in i enjoyed following their teams and their schools and and you know they still put out a, a poll for high school and they cover some games they give you Score results, no more box scores. There was a day when there were high school box scores and things like that. And I think last year, uh, when they put out their all met section, it was just inside the sports. And I will, I know, I know, I'm I'm old. I still get the newspaper delivered to my house. I'm I'm sorry. I I, I enjoy that, uh, and uh, and I like going out to the front stoop every day to pick it up. But they put out a separate section for the fall sports. You know, football field hockey some schools participate in golf in the fall some do it in the spring uh, volleyball soccer all those things and uh and it's nice it's nice you get the the team pictures from the uh you know offense and defense and you know occasionally uh of my interest you'll see a a kid in there from montgomery county a lot of them are from the private schools like Dematha and Gonzaga and good counsel, but you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing and nice full color pictures, all those things that, that I grew up, you know, before I went to high school, not that I really had dreams of ever being all met, which wasn't going to happen, but you know, following the, the players that made it and where they went in their careers, whether it was college or ultimately the pros, nice thing. So I'll just, you know, say into the post, don't drop this. I, I know you're having to cut things, but Please keep this going. I know how important it is to young kids who who not maybe they're not going to be in there, but they get to follow their friends and their school, and eh, it's just uh, yeah, whatever. Um, all right, let's get to this. Uh, the Cowboys lost on Sunday, but the Eagles are in something of a free fall. They uh, they have now lost three straight games, and it does not look like Jalen Hurts is Jalen Hurts anymore, and Hurts kind of threw his team under the bus that saying after the game he wasn't sure about the commitment I'm paraphrasing there but that's that's the gist of it and so you know while the Cowboys certainly stubbed their toe getting blown out in Buffalo losing in Buffalo this time of year eh, maybe not the same thing so as we come down the home stretch here with three games to go Jeff Saturday was on our morning show undisputed yesterday and the question was about handicapping the two teams Who's in a better spot right now, both of them with four losses, the Cowboys or the Eagles? Here's my issue with the Eagles. I would have said the Eagles. Last night I was disappointed the finish, right? Like they, their defense definitely played better. Uh, Matt Patricia, you know, they, 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 they played a little bit better. But the last drive, right, I mean, everything's on the line. Um, you know, they're at the eight-yard line to start the drive, and, and you give up a touchdown, it's just, that, that's just, that, that, that's a tough thing to overcome. I think all the Cowboys' losses to me are very similar, and and the Cowboys are going to have to kind of answer that. I, would, I guess I'll still lean the Eagles. I probably have more confidence that the Eagles will find a way because they can they can make games ugly and and um, you know kind of grimy, and they found ways to beat good teams throughout the season. That way, the Cowboys haven't done that quite as well. Jeff, when we're coming down the stretch of the season and we're looking at teams that we definitively would put on that tier one, you're one of the best teams in the NFL Super Bowl contender category. We have the 49ers. We have the Ravens. 
Who else would you put in that conversation or put on that tier? Mm, uh, I, I don't know that I'd put anybody else on that mm-hmm. tier right now. In all honesty, I think you know when you when you look at. I, in fact, I would even say that the Niners, um, the way they have played, they they look like um, you know no, nobody wants to face them. I, I I put the Ravens below them, and I would say um, I I would have more confidence in the Niners than the Ravens. But to your point. The, the Ravens are scary because of what Lamar Jackson can do and the way he can buy time and do some of those things. Uh, but but the most complete team in the NFL is San Fran. So uh, teams that you would be scared of, you know, listen, Mahomes, if they get, get hot, getting in the playoffs, same thing for, like, the Bills. But, I, I mean, I think part of it is there's a lot of 500-ish teams in both the NFC and the AFC that if they get running, it kind of reminds me of those, you know, the Giants teams kind of back in the day. If they can kind of find a way to get in, um, they they can be those teams that are tough outs and, and you know, teams that play better than you give them credit for. Uh, they went through some tough stretches of the season but have found their way kind of in the latter part of the season. There, it's just, there's just not a lot of separation. And to me, other than San Fran and, to your point, Baltimore. Jeff, I want to follow up on something you said because I think, you know, we all look at San Fran as the favorite right now to win it all. And, and coming from you with somebody who knows this inside and out as a player and a coach, like you just put them on a pretty high level. Do you look at it as Super Bowl or bust for the Niners right now? Yeah, I do. Listen, they, they are, they, I mean, it, it, barring injuries, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so, you know, when I, I will say seeing uh, McCaffrey tape up his knee did not give me the warm and fuzz. I didn't, I didn't love that, right? So you get concerned when you see those kinds of things because I think as good as their offense is and as productive as they have been, when Debo Samuel wasn't playing, their offense at, and and Trent Williams weren't playing. They're you know they they didn't look nearly so. This is a team that is that is based on their starters and and you know as far as like depth, I'm not sure that that part gets checked. But man, um, they are they are legit. I mean, they are a team that that when they get going, uh, it can get ugly for the opposition in a hurry. Jeff, I feel the same way about the Ravens, though, in a little bit different manner. We thought the AFC was going to be such a gauntlet this season, but because of one reason or another, mainly starting quarterback injuries, the path for them has really cleared to the Super Bowl. And that's not going to be the same case next season where they don't have the same type of uh, competition in the AFC and everyone is relatively healthy. So do you think the same applies for Baltimore? I do. I think. Listen, I think Baltimore has, you know, the way they played against the Jags, but again, my issue with Baltimore is – I always feel like they make games closer than they really should be, right? Like, like, like they kind of leave teams in it um, as games progress, and you just, you, you know, you'd like to see them knock them out earlier, right? And and so um, that that is what that's the only that would be the only concern I would have. Where you know you see San Fran when they play the best, and they're they're you know they they're hanging what a buck thirty or something like that on on Dallas and the Eagles, and giving up what a thirty point whatever it is a hundred point swing, some kind of crazy number. I haven't seen that type of dominance out of the Ravens, um, you know, quite as much as San Fran. But to your point, they are uh, they're loaded. This is what I would say about the playoffs, though. Mahomes gets in if Allen gets in, right? If if these teams that get in and they get hot, it is a much closer division to me than than I would say the NFC is, and that's because quarterback play matters in in the playoffs and so you can get into those games where if you got to go match points for points it becomes more difficult uh for the ravens in my opinion than san francisco so that's uh, jeff saturday on the best of the divisions and who's going to possibly come out and play in the super bowl we also have the other side of this and oh washington is familiar with this remember in 2000 when they won the division with a 7-9 and nine record, hosted a playoff game against Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. That kind of thing is in play this year. Uh, Houston, which was supposed to stink this year, uh, could have had the worst record in the league last year if Lovey Smith didn't deliver a middle finger on his way out the door and beat the Colts in the final game. But they've got C.J. Stroud, who's hurt right now. I don't know whether he comes back, but... Uh, right now, Houston is leading the AFC South at eight and six, and then you have Indianapolis and Jacksonville both at eight and six. Now, you would think with Trevor Lawrence that Jacksonville would have the upper hand and would come out of it, but Lawrence is, is gimpy with uh, with an ankle that he hurt, and you know who knows how it's going to all play out over the last three. So that's a division that could have a winner with a losing record, and then in the NFC South, that's really crapola. 
New Orleans, 7-7. Seven and seven. Okay, they just beat the Giants, but so what? Uh, Tampa is 7-7. Seven and seven. They're coming off a win in Green Bay. Baker Mayfield may be resuscitating his career. Atlanta, Atlanta lost to Washington. They're not out of it, but they're six and eight. And then you got the worst team in football in Carolina in that division at two and twelve. So you have the possibility of the NFC South being one with a losing record and the AFC South being one with a losing record. Matt Hasselbeck, former analyst with ESPN, on with Dan Patrick the other day, asked this question: Should a team with a losing record be able to host a playoff game? Well, I'm super biased because we were seven and nine in Seattle in 2010 when uh, Pete Carroll was first year head coach. We had a tough year. And then for whatever reason, the defending world champion, New Orleans Saints, Drew Brees, Sean Payton, um, they were the wild card team and had to come play us at seven and nine. And we won the game, you know, so but but I I tell people a lot, uh, you know, a lot about this. And I was talking to my high school team about this this year. Pete Carroll had us believe in that we were not seven and nine. Like they all, everyone in the NFL says, hey, you got to got to play your best football at the end of the year. Pete Carroll had us believing that we are zero and zero. They are zero and zero. We deserve to be here. And I think that was a big reason that, you know, we played so well that day and we, and we beat them. So, uh, no, it doesn't make sense. But like playoff football and NFL football doesn't make sense sometimes. And I'm always told, well, rah-rah doesn't work in the NFL. A college guy doesn't work in the NFL. Why is Pete Carroll, a rah-rah guy, the oldest coach in the NFL, even though he doesn't act it, how does that work? And I was 35 years old when I was his starting quarterback. And the last thing I wanted was this, like, rah-rah college guy. Like, I, I was just not going to be into it. Bag drills, you got to tap, like, the, the top of the door before you walk into every room, before you go out to practice. Like, I wanted to hate it. I literally wanted to hate it. And listen, back then, 35 years old as a starting quarterback was like ancient. You know, Tom Brady and people have like blown that out of the water. But back then, you know, so like all I can say is I thought he was incredible as a head coach. Uh, he had like a John Wooden quality about him where like on Wednesdays, our coaches, our assistant coaches, we weren't even allowed to talk about who we were playing next. It was just about us versus us, our best versus our best, our ones versus our ones, which is very different in the NFL. So I didn't necessarily think it was uh, it was as raw, raw as it was. We're going to do everything right. And the score will take care of itself, which for me is a Bill Walsh thing that I learned from Mike Holmgren and Andy Reid. And I believed in that. And and so, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Pete. I think he does a great job. That's Matt Hasselbeck, of, uh, well, formerly of the Seahawks, most of his career. Did start out in Green Bay, back it up Brett Favre for a little while, then moved on to ESPN as an analyst. And now uh, when they had their big cutback last summer, he was out, but he's moved on to coach high school football and just won a state championship in Massachusetts. Pretty cool. So the, the thought about what to do here with teams with losing records and, and should they be allowed to host playoff games, I'm not really sure what you do other than to cut down on the number of divisions. Now, they have divisions for two reasons. One, geographic, although you know Dallas to Washington or Philly or New York is, is quite a schlep. But, okay, they, they're, they're in the East. They've been in the East forever. And, you know, most of these teams, it's a, it's a short flight to play, and you have a home-and-home, home, and that's good for building up rivalries. On the other hand, um, now that you have all these teams making the playoffs, you don't really get screwed anymore with these divisions, like you'd have a, a year, I think – one year when when Brady was hurt and Matt Castle stepped in for the Patriots, they went eleven and five and didn't make the playoffs. Washington missed a couple of times at ten and six back in the day. Um, but if you were to cut down on the number of divisions, that would lead to less of this, I guess. Uh, but I don't know how you'd still keep the division rivalries going every year. I'm not sure how that would work. But that's how you could eliminate. It. I don't think it's a huge problem, and I think as as Hasselbeck points out there, it's it's kind of a cool thing when you have the defending champion Saints having to play on the road against the Seattle team with a losing record, and Seattle wins. And what Taylor Heineke did against Tampa Bay was was fun to watch. It was it was entertaining football. It's, you know, and the, boy, talk about David versus Goliath. Taylor Heineke in, uh, I, guess, I think it was his first start, if I'm not mistaken, at least for Washington. He'd started a couple of games before, but... Uh, you know, to 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 see what uh, to see what he did and and make it exciting and diving for the pylon and uh, you know this this kid who was on his sister's couch early in the season playing the greatest of all time who was on his way to his seventh Super Bowl championship, 
I don't know. Uh, so I'm I'm not I'm not opposed to the idea of not making a change. You know, you're going to have those years where a division stinks like it does in the NFC South this year and the AFC South. Okay, you're going to have a winner, but it doesn't seem like teams that are really good are getting screwed out of being in the playoffs because they have so many damn playoff teams now. Once they, you know, that's where the money is, more television, more product, more more games, that's what they want. Next hour, we'll take a further look at where Sam Howell is right now and is this becoming a situation where drafting a quarterback and they sit at number 4 right now, drafting a quarterback in April is now not just an option, but a must. We'll get to that more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. Before we dive back into the Sam Howell discussion, uh, let me give you a little update, because I've been critical of Tommy DeVito and his family. Not that it's not a fun story from New York, the way they're embracing their Italian heritage and I think playing up some stereotypes, but okay, you know, this is a kid that didn't expect to take the field this year undrafted free agent uh, probably thought he'd spend the whole year on the practice squad maybe get an opportunity here and there for other teams to see him and he's living out his dream he's you know they lost last week to the Saints but he reeled off three straight wins as the starting quarterback for the Giants and he's keeping his job despite being sacked seven times last week and so he's got this agent now the agent is is part of the story too uh, Sean Stilato. And uh, and he's basking in the limelight as well. You know, he showed up on the sidelines in a green suit last week. Like, nobody's going to notice him, right? You know, it's like right out of the Robert Griffin playbook. Like, hey, look at me, look at me. And uh, he's he's enjoying his 15 minutes of fame along with his client, Tommy DeVito. So, story came out yesterday that a pizza parlor in Morristown, New Jersey, Coniglio's Old Fashioned Pizzeria, pizzeria Coniglio's, had arranged for Tommy DeVito to make an appearance there, and it was their understanding that he was going to show up for $10,000, and he was going to spend two hours there, sign 250 autographs. And they put out uh, something on social media that said, well, sorry, we had to cancel because his agent called up Sean Stilato and said, yeah, the the price is now $20,000. And Stilato denied that. He said, no, we, we didn't have a contract. And they said, well, yeah, we might not have a contract, but we had an agreement. We had a, we had a handshake agreement on this, and so we just can't do it. We're not going to do it for $20,000. Good for Tommy DeVito. Now, in some sense, he threw Sean Stilato under the bus here because he showed up yesterday afternoon unannounced uh, and presumably unpaid because they don't have a deal. And uh, spent some time there. Uh, there's pictures of him making sodas, eating a slice of pizza. You know, it's all uh, it's all good now. And I think that was a good move on the part of DeVito because he was starting to trend in the direction of, oh, God, the fame has gotten to him and, he, and he's a bad guy. Uh, now, it's going to be probably ugly when they play at Philadelphia on Christmas Day. But, you know, this this puts a little bit more shine on him and also makes Stilato look like the bad guy. Now, agents will generally do this. They'll say, you know, let let me take the hit, not you. My job is to take care of you, to get you the most money, and make sure you're protected, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that happened, and, and DeVito was at the at the pizza parlor where Stilato looks, you know, kind of foolish here. It, it, whether or not, you know, he had a signed contract or not, He's not denying the fact that he did raise the price. He's just saying we didn't have a signed agreement for ten thousand dollars. And when I went back to them, I said it's twenty, and they said, "Well, we got a handshake agreement." And he said that, "Yeah, that's not good enough." Whatever. So that 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 storm has blown over. Meantime, though, out of nowhere, here comes Todd McShay. I haven't heard from Todd McShay in a while. He's the Todd 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 from from Mel. Uh, and I thought they had a really good thing going, kind of like a PTI thing where Todd, the younger guy, would go at Mel and they would argue about draft picks and it made for good television. And for whatever reason, McShay was put out with some of the other people over the summer when they had all the big cutbacks, Keyshawn and Max here and other other hosts, uh, Susie Kalber out. A bunch of people uh, were let go and he was let go. I don't know what he's doing now, but he was on a podcast hosted by Ryan Rossillo on The Ringer. Rossillo, a former ESPN host, uh, did, I think, the greatest national radio show in sports ever with Scott Van Pelt. 
national radio shows and sports generally are not that effective because sports are local. They were really good, and ESPN didn't realize it, so they put Scott Van Pelt, not that his career has taken any kind of a hit. Uh, he's uh, he's done great in his spot on television, now hosting, among other things, the Monday Night Countdown show and his uh, very successful show at midnight on ESPN. But McShay was out, and uh, he's now uh, guesting, I guess, and doing some other things, whatever else he's doing. He's on with Priscilla, and he decided to take down Sean Stellato. This is great. When you have a 30 year old high school grudge, these are these are wonderful things. So he tells this story. He says senior year in high school, we're seven and zero, and we're going to play Salem, Massachusetts. And if we win this game and if we win the last two, we're going to play in the Super Bowl. I guess the Super Bowl would be their state championship. Anyway, he says we lose to this team in, in Salem. Sean Stellato is the quarterback. All week long, it was like this big media frenzy because the Salem teachers, including their head coach, were on strike. But the coach crossed the picket line for Salem so he could coach in the game, and they won. And then McShay says, we go on to win the next two. We're getting word from our play-by-play guy. It's trickling down the sidelines that Salem is losing to Beverly, this uh, team on the other side of Massachusetts. If we lose this game... We're going to go to this Super if they lose, he says. So, so in other words, they lost the game uh, to Salem. But uh, if if Salem loses that game, then his team would get to go uh, go to the state championship. And Stellato throws a touchdown pass. He says with no time left, and they win the game. We're shut out. Season's over. High school career is over. Fifteen years later, I get word from somebody I know who's talked to Stellato, who's writing a book about it. Stellato wants to contact me to do an interview. I tell him to go F himself, okay? And I think it's all going to go away. And I'm sitting on my couch a couple of weeks ago watching Monday Night Football, and I look at this guy like, holy S, that's Sean Stellato. He won't go away. He's like the rodent that won't go away in my life. McShay played quarterback for Swampscott High School and uh, had been carrying this grudge for a long time. I think Dave Portnoy. Went to Swamp's got. I think they're friends. I think they're friends from that. They both went to Michigan uh, and uh, didn't play sports there, obviously, but they're lifelong friends from their days in high school. Uh, so, you know, this this guy, <laughs> Stellato, he's uh, he, he's creating a lot of attention and, and good for McShay for carrying a, a high school grudge to go back that many years. That's 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 really incredible. All right. Uh, the Sam Howell situation. Um you, you may have, I tried to play some of this, but I guess they didn't have, the audio wasn't set up properly by the team, and I, I didn't have the audio. But Ben Standing of The Athletic on Monday, at the Monday news conference that Ron Rivera always holds, he was pressing him on the decision to pull Sam Howell out of the game on Sunday in Los Angeles and go with Jacoby Brissett, who, you know, came close, relatively close, to pulling off a comeback. They're down 28-7. to He puts up two touchdowns quickly. Uh, unlikely they're going to recover the onside kick, but if they do, there is the possibility that that game goes to overtime. He was able to to put them in that position after it looked like it was over, and that was Rivera's stance. Well, I took Sam out to protect him. I, I wanted him to be in a position where, uh, you know, he, he wasn't, I guess, he was saying he didn't want him to get hurt. Now, this kind of flies in the face of of what he has been doing all year with Sam Howe. You know, he's kept them in there in the debacle in Dallas on Thanksgiving Day where they got their doors blown out. Uh, Brissett, you know, handed off a couple of times at the end of the Miami game, but he kept them in that one too. And, you know, the, the, the thinking, according to Rivera, is, yeah, it looks bad, it looks ugly, but we got to let him take his lumps so that, you know, at the end of the season he will have experienced these things and, and be ready to move on. And remember, he, he said at the beginning of the season – that it was all about, you know, Sam Howell, that that it was going to be a year where they're going to develop him. And uh, and after they made the trades at the deadline where they traded away Montez Sweat and Chase Young, he said, don't worry, you know, basically this. He said, that he's, this is the quote, he said, I know what my goals are, I know what my vision is, but I'm not going to shake and waver on Sam or this offense or what we're doing. Well, it seems like when you pull him out of a game that was – yeah, long shot, but winnable at that point. Um, you know that that's an indication that you are wavering. That's the way it it looks to me. Um, so 
you know, he kept Howell in games like Buffalo, where they had, you know, nine sacks for Sam Howell, 14 hits. That was the, that was the biggest blowout of the year. Uh, he, he kept him in there, didn't pull him out. And now he's saying, oh, yeah, I, I got to protect him. Uh, you know, what's that all about? But I think it leads to a further belief now that's, that, that's growing in the organization. Doesn't really matter with Rivera since he's not going to be here next year. But the feeling of, wait a minute, uh, the door's not closed. Sam Howell isn't necessarily the answer. Now, I pulled a couple of things that Rivera did in his weekly interview with Chick Hernandez on Channel 9. It's a little different than a press conference, and Chick does a good job of getting him to uh, loosen up a little bit, and he reveals maybe a little more. He's still pretty guarded in what he says. But uh, let's let's go through a couple things, and then I got uh, a column today from Nikki Javala, which outlines the regression that we've seen from Sam Howell recently. Remember, they open up the season beating a bad Arizona team, and, uh, and then that game, Howell had a strip sack that went the other way for a touchdown, but they held on to win 20-16. to 16. Then Denver, which the following week gave up 70 to Miami, still trying to find themselves under Sean Payton. Uh, Washington held on to win 35-33, even with the, the only onside kick all year in the NFL being converted against them. Denver was able to pull it off, and it really you know, took a Hail Mary at the end, which was finally knocked down for them to hold on to win by two. Then they come home to play Buffalo, and they lost the game 37-3. to That's the game where Howell is sacked nine times, and he threw four interceptions. He was god-awful. The following week, October 1st, they go to Philadelphia. And at that point, you know, they're 2-1 and one on the year, and they take the Eagles to overtime, and they wind up losing. Now, when assessing this season and where it's gone, remember that's the fourth game of the season. They have now played 14 of them, so 10 more since then. But Rivera is trying to pin the blame on this disaster of a season which started out 2-0 and and is now at 4-10. and He's trying to pin it on that game? Listen. Probably one of the things that really took the wind out of our sails um, could be looked at as the loss to Philadelphia in Philadelphia. You know, we, 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 we played well. We played hard. We gave ourselves a chance at the very end, go into overtime, and we have, a, uh, you know, an unfortunate play where Terry makes a great catch, but unfortunately he steps on somebody's hand, which yeah. apparently doesn't mean that it doesn't translate that – you caught the ball, you, 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 you established, but the rule says that right. when you step on something, it doesn't count as being in bounds. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, you know, come on, really? I mean, the fourth game of the year, and there's no guarantee that if that pass holds up that they get the game-winning field goal, the Eagles were able to do it and win the game. And they got actually a lot of credit for hanging with the Eagles, the defending NFC champs. Okay. But they didn't go anywhere from there. Now, you're going to blame what happened next on that? They came back, and they played a Thursday night game against Chicago where they were god-awful. They lost that game 40-20, to and the Bears had their way with a really bad Washington defense. Then they go to Atlanta. They beat a Falcons team, which may not make the playoffs this year. I won that 24-16. to That might be the high-water mark of the season, <laughs> winning that game. Uh, then they lose an ugly game to the Giants uh, at New York, 14-7, to bunch of turnovers there. That was the Jonathan Allen tirade where he dropped a bunch of F-bombs about being here for seven years and not, not seeing the end, of the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, they get credit for playing close with Philadelphia, but they lost. That's the NFL. You know, game, most games are close. They lost the game by a touchdown, 38-31, and the free fall uh, would continue after they play a really bad New England team. Okay, the New England Patriots stink. They might be the worst or second worst team in the NFL, and Washington scored just enough to win there, twenty to seventeen. But then it's uh, it's more the same. Big mistakes against Seattle. They lose there. They lose to the Giants at home. Tommy DeVito beats them. Another ugly game. Dallas on Thanksgiving Day, an embarrassment, forty-five to ten. Miami, 45-15, and then a game not as close as the final score. They lose to the Rams 28-20. to So, you know, where is this point? A lot of teams have bad games and, and have bad things happen to them, like may or may not have happened with the bad call on Terry McLaurin. But you don't just go into free fall, and after that you win only two more against a bad Atlanta team and a bad New England team. 
and you don't win another game at home for the rest of the year? Come on, Ron. Really? You, you want to simplify it down to that? I don't think so. This is the uh, this is Chick and, and some good questions here with Rivera about the decision to pull Sam Howell from a game that was okay. It was it was a big score, it was twenty eight to seven, but plenty of time left in the fourth quarter for some type of a miracle, something to happen. But Hal had a terrible day. He had a career low in passing yardage, 109 yards. He threw an, another interception, fourth straight game he has done that, and he pulled him out. So this was this was the conversation that Chick Hernandez had with Ron Rivera the other day about that decision. Yeah, I know, but I'm concerned with him. And, and, and again, a big part of it is when you get into a game like that and there is a lead like that, the other team's just going to cut it loose. And when you get in those situations – now, with where things are, you, you, you don't want to see him have to do something or take on something that he doesn't need to. And how do you counsel him now with three games left? Uh, I think you said after the game, he is our starting quarterback. Uh, the, the thing we have to understand is about him learning, growing, and, and developing. And, and when we get to a point where, you know, that I feel that potentially could be a negative situation, I've got to, I've got to do something. I've got to take care of the quarterback, and, and that's what I have to look at it. As and, and you know when you have the, the the savvy veteran that you do in Jacoby, a guy that you know you can see how he uses his experience to go out and perform in those types of situations. You know that's a good thing. That's and it's a good lesson for him to watch and learn. Why is I mean, if the offense looked different with Jacoby, or at least obviously production-wise, it mm -hmm. was different. Why is that? Well, I think again he came into a situation that as a veteran guy he's handled before, and you know. He he did some he did some things that that a savvy guy can do and and you saw that. Okay, but why weren't you using that savvy guy earlier? Your your plan apparently was to stick with Hal through thick and thin, but you still put in Jacoby Brissett into that game. Wasn't it more important to have Sam Howell suffer through more problems so he can learn from it, so he can develop? Now, Nikki Jabala, the Post today has a chart of what has happened to Sam Howell's play in recent weeks, and probably it's because he's been beat down from all the sacks that's that's played a factor he's, he's had 59 sacks this year uh, leading the league in that and she writes in recent weeks Hal has declined statistically in numerous areas he's tossed six interceptions three were pick sixes in the past four games his passer rating has dropped from 75.5 dropped two I should say 75.5 from 90.1 in the first eight weeks so it's dropped 15% there. His completion percentage has dipped to 61.7% from 66.9 in week eight. His 102 passing yards and 42.3 completion rate against the Rams were career lows. And she looks at his, his ratings, you know, as they say, first eight weeks of the season when they went three and five, his passer rating was 90.1. In weeks nine through 15, the last six, it's 75.5. His completion percentage Dropped six points, 66.9% weeks one through eight, 61.7 weeks nine through 15. Interceptions per attempts, weeks one through eight, 2.6, up a little bit to 3.1. And his sack percentage has dropped. Well, it couldn't have possibly gone up because he was a, a sacking machine. But uh, weeks one through eight, it was 11.7%. It's down to 7.3. So he has declined. Uh, whether or not he's grown, you know, you can argue that. And they got they got some tough games coming up. The Jets are the worst team in the NFL offensively, but they're they're right up there, top ten in defense. And then they got the 49ers, who are maybe the best team in the league, probably the best team in the league. It's home game, but they don't play well at home either. And then they have the Cowboys coming in, and it looks like with the Cowboys neck and neck with the Eagles, they're going to have something to play for. So it's bad now. It's getting worse. And how much worse it's going to get over the last three, we don't know. But I think what we're seeing now, whoever comes in here probably has to draft a quarterback. And the cost of keeping Howell is cheap. He's got two years left on his rookie deal. $1.1 million next year, $1.2 million the following year. That's a cheap backup. You know, if they bring in somebody who can start as a rookie or even even look at the idea, I don't think they would because they would be in rebuilding. But even if you want to bring in a veteran, that's still cheap. I mean, Jacoby Brissett made $8 million this year. So they could cut their backup costs if they do draft somebody uh, to $1.1 million. And if you bring in a, a guy in the top four, I don't know what he's uh, – probably like $5 million a year, something like that. They, they've really managed to, to uh, get a handle on that after some of the big – 
first round bus. So there you go. That's uh, that's a picture that's changed. It's gone from Hal's our guy to yeah, we kind of think Hal's our guy, but the guy who's calling the shots right now isn't going to be calling the shots next year. All right, Tony's coming up next. Have a good rest of the day. I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.